let's, we'll get things kicked off so we stay on track. Um, so first and foremost, thank you for taking some time out of your evening to join us for our Valentine's Day at home workshop. So this evening we're joined by Lori Forrester, the wine coach, and Chef Laura Hagen. And we're really excited um, for the lineup that we have to offer you guys this evening. To kick things off, I want to introduce myself. My name is Caitlin Swope, and I'm the Director of Consumer Affairs with the Northeast Beef Promotion Initiative. Um, so just to give you a little background, we extend nationally developed beef checkoff messaging and content within the Northeast region. So pictured there on your screen is what we classify as the, the Northeast region, so that Maine to Virginia. So there's a lot of people, um, about 25% of the population, yet there's not a lot of cattle. So there's not a lot of um, funding that's generated. So we seek funding on a national level um, to do educational programs such as this um, to promote beef and just really educate consumers about beef's journey from pasture to plate. Um, another fun fact within our region, uh, people outnumber cattle 14 to one. So again, just another powerful statistic um, that you can jot down and save for a rainy day. With that, I'm gonna move into just some best practices so that we all have a good experience tonight. Um, just as an FYI, this workshop is being recorded so that those folks who weren't able to tune in live tonight can catch the replay um, and still have time to learn these great skills prior to Valentine's Day. If you can, we want you to leave your camera on so that this can be an interactive experience. Um, as I mentioned, if you guys can just mute your lines for the time being, we'll have open Q&A and conversation at the end. Um, and please utilize the chat feature. Um, you should find that at the bottom of your screen. So you can type in any questions that you have during the workshop and I'll be sure to interject with those questions to make sure we get them answered when it makes sense. Um, and if not, like I said, we'll have that open Q&A at the end. Now moving towards what our goals are for tonight. So we really want you to leave this workshop inspired to cook with beef at home this Valentine's Day. We know things are still looking different. There's a variety of you know, closures with restaurants, things just look different. So we really wanna inspire you that you can still have that same experience with beef at home. So with that, we're gonna have the beef and wine pairing with Lori, and then Chef Laura is going to demonstrate and bring you guys along on the creation of a beef pate appetizer. And then she's gonna demonstrate uh, cooking a beef filet mignon in the cast iron skillet and finishing it off in the oven and then demonstrating how to create a pan sauce. So really looking forward to that. And now to kick things off and introduce um, our featured speakers, which you've already heard quite a bit about, um, but I wanna first introduce Lori. So our wine expert is a certified sommelier, TV personality and author of the award-winning book, The Sipping Point, A Crash Course in Wine. She has certifications with the American Sommelier Association, the Wine and Spirits Education Trust, and has also trained at the Culinary Arts or Culinary Institute of America. You may have seen her as a guest on the Dr. Oz show or read about her mobile app, The Wine Coach, which was listed as one of the top eight wine apps in Wine Enthusiast. So helping us to demystify wine and beef, we're welcoming Lori Forrester. And then before I turn it over to Lori, I also wanna introduce Chef Laura Hagen. She has over 15 years of culinary experience, and she's the former senior director of the Beef It's What's for Dinner culinary programming. So by no means is she a stranger to beef, and we're really glad to bring her back and uh, feature her this evening. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it over to Lori, and we can get things kicked off. Hey guys, welcome everyone. I'm so thrilled to have you here tonight for our inspiration for maybe a Valentine's or Galentine's dinner. And I'm going to start out telling you about the three wines that I selected, one to go with chef's appetizer, the other two that could be options for your filet mignon dinner. 
And then I'm going to hand it over to Chef for the demo. But I want to thank Caitlin for that amazing introduction. And she did introduce me perfectly as the sommelier. Last week, I did one of these events and I was introduced as the salmonella, <laughs> which, as you may know, is a foodborne disease and not at all what I want to be introduced as. So thank you, Caitlin. I so appreciate that. Um, I'm going to show you how to properly open a bottle of sparkling wine or champagne because I find that not everyone knows the little tick trips and uh, tips and tricks we know in the wine world. So I'm gonna start there. Um, if you haven't opened your bottle, just follow along with me. So our fir first wine that we're featuring is the Gruet Sparkling Rosé, and I'm gonna tell you a ton about it, but let me just show you how we open champagne in the world of wine pros. The first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna look for a little tab that can help you peel away your foil. It's either gonna be a tab that's just slightly different colored or it might be a little piece of, um, a little piece of plastic that you pull around. This one has a tab. Um, some of them have a pull, but if you've got the Gruet, you have the tab. Sometimes they come off really, really easy. Sometimes it's one of those days, but it still came off almost in one piece. So you should be able to go around all in one. Then what you're gonna look for is this little round tab there and you're gonna flip that down and there are exactly six turns on that tab. So you're gonna one, two, three, four, five, six. Now I have loosened this middle metal cage. Never, ever, ever have I ever <laughs> wanted to let my finger off this cork because if you do, the pressure in this bottle could potentially blow and you could actually knock your eye out. So you don't wanna do that. You wanna keep your finger on top there. And then if you were in a fine dining restaurant, you might use a white serviette or napkin, but I'm just going to use my hand here and I'm gonna put my hand on top of that cage, the other hand at the bottom of the bottle. Now, most people think you twist the cork to take it out of the bottle, but in fact, what you're doing is twisting the bottle. And so as I'm twisting the bottle, I'm also, pressing down a little bit on this cork so that I can control when it comes out. Because this cork, if I just kind of let it do what it wants to do, will just go flying or make a really loud sound. And what you want is a really soft side, just like you just heard. So that is the proper way to open a bottle of champagne or sparkling wine. Twist the bottle, leave the metal cage on, but as you're twisting that bottle, make sure you're letting it ease up, but you're pressing down a little bit so you're controlling the opening. So I hope you guys uh, <laughs> have done that or we'll do it that way next time, but never ever take off that cage and then just let the cork sit there because it's super dangerous. All right, so I'm gonna pour myself a little taste. I suggest you do the same so I could tell you a little bit more about this delicious wine. This is gonna go with our beef pate appetizer. And I brought one of my new favorite wine accessories to show you. This is the Vin Glacé. Your sparkling wine bottle goes right inside. And then it has a top that you can just screw, push down and just screw right on there. And now it's basically encapsulated in a nice bucket. So I don't have to worry about that getting warm or anything happening to it. Love that. All right. Any questions I see? Oh yes, a reminder, you must preheat your oven to 425. If, you're not, if you haven't done that, have someone run in the kitchen if you're trying to cook along with us. Um, Amber got a nice little laugh. I like that, perfect. Um, yes, I will type in the name and the website of the Glacé uh, when Chef takes over for the demo. Perfect. All right, so the, what I have here is the Gruet Sparkling Rosé. If you at home have the Gruet, and I'm gonna turn my gallery on, hold it up so I can see what you guys are drinking or if you have a different rosé bubbly, hopefully you have something bubbly. Okay, I see some gruets. I see some alternate rosés, perfect. As, yes, hey there girls. Kylie, I see you have the rosé there, perfect. So the gruet that I'm tasting this evening is from New Mexico, which I know you say, what? What, you're drinking a sparkling rosé from New Mexico? My absolute love of this wine is that it's always a best buy. It's usually around, uh, on wine.com, I found it for $16.99, but anywhere from that $17 to $22. The Gruet family that runs this winery in uh, tr near Truth or Consequence is actually from Champagne, France. 
They learned everything they know how to make champagne in France, and then they have brought all that know-how over here. They started uh, opening their winery in 1983, so they've been doing it for a while. And anything that Gruet makes that's bubbly, I would absolutely buy anytime. Their products are top-notch. And like I said, um, it uses a method called method champenois or method traditionnel, which means they make this wine in the same process that they do in Champagne, France. But because it's not from that region, at least in the wine world, we can't call it champagne. We have to call it sparkling wine. So the only difference really is that this is made in a different place. The process is the same. The grape that's used to make this rosé is Pinot Noir, which is the one of the red grapes of Champagne, France but one of the red grapes that the Gruet family focuses on. And I really love um, one of the things when you are tasting rosé sparkling, if you wanna lift your glass to the uh, camera so I can see you guys, tilt it at an angle so you can see the color. It's a beautiful pale salmon, which is wonderful. And with sparkling wine, you wanna look at the bubbles. They should be tiny and persistent traveling up your glass, which mine are. Um, the second thing you want to do with this is give it a little sniff. And there, there's lots of red fruits. So when we say that, we mean strawberry, raspberry uh, there. But there's also this little toastiness that comes from that champagne method that they use in which the yeast cells sit with the wine to give it this bready, biscuity smell to it. It's classic for champagne and sparkling wines that are made by the champagne method. So I absolutely, um, when I was thinking of this pairing, thought, ooh, sparkling rosé would be perfect because Chef is going to be making a beef pate with roast beef and some uh, garlic creamed cheese from Alouette. And I thought, wow, we're always trying to match the weight of the food to the weight of the wine. So that's a, a lighter beef kind of a dish. It's rare roast beef. And often I'll tell people if you're pairing their things with rare beef, look for wines that are the color of the doneness. So rare roast beef and rosés, it just kind of balances out really nicely. Go ahead, take a sip. This is a bone dry, brute style sparkling wine. And what you'll notice is because it's made in that more artisanal method of champagne, those bubbles just dissolve really nicely on the palate and it's just really elegant, but it's dry on the finish and your mouth waters a little bit and that's the acidity from the wine. And that acidity is gonna match up nicely with anything with salt or acid. And that's gonna be in our pate, right? Because the cheese that we have has some salty tanginess to it as does the deli roast beef. So I'm very excited for you to try this. Um, with the pairing. I will give you guys the link, make sure. Other things that you can have with this, you can have this with seafood, you can have this with a carpaccio, beef carpaccio, if you like that. Um, any kind of, you know, charcuterie board would be really fun with this. Uh, Caitlin, I think we might have featured this on one of our charcuterie board or a similar type wine. And that, that toasty biscuity smell that you get is because we actually let the wine lay down in the shed, in the sparkling wine caves for two years we, with those yeast cells that are part of the fermentation. And that gives it this wonderful warmth and toastiness. So it's, think of that, they have to wait two years to sell their wine. So they're really putting all their love and uh, heart into this wine. So I hope you enjoy it. And a little teaser, this is what we're gonna be trying with our pate appetizer. Um, quick one on glassware, because you're gonna notice different glassware as I go throughout. This is a traditional champagne flute, which is great for keeping your sparkling wines bubbly. But there's a new way of thinking in the wine world that white wine glasses, this being a stemless one, are better for sparkling wine because you get more aromas and flavor out of the wine but they won't stay as sparkling as long as with this shape. So you can kind of experiment around, see which one you prefer, uh, try the wine out of both type glasses and see, you will see a difference in a enhanced aromas, enhanced flavors in the white wine glass, but not maybe staying as bubbly as mine is still so great and bubbly right now. So that's a fun thing. Uh, to, to try around. Any questions about the rosé bubbly before we talk about some of our big reds? 
I mean, I think that's so romantic. Just anything with sparkling wine to start off your dinner. If you're doing a, a Valentine's, just puts everybody in, in a better mood and a nice transition from work or kids or life. And so I love to start anything out with a sparkling wine. All right, I don't see any questions. So Caitlin will keep me, uh, keep me informed. A little professional tip for you. If you keep a wine glass in each hand, you can't touch your face. I don't know if you guys know that, but might save your life someday. Um, we're gonna taste two different reds that are both, I think, great pairings with the filet mignon that Chef's gonna make in a little bit. And here I'm just gonna really go through the whole process we do when we professionally taste wine, because with sparkling wine, it's a little bit different. And I'd love to go through it with our still wines because we can go through each, each and every step. So. The first wine we're gonna talk about is from Dow. And Dow is in uh, the Paso Robles region in California for many years. I thought it was Paso Robles and a lot of other wine people do, but I got to visit there a few years back and they said, mm -mm, the locals, we call it Paso Robles. So I am now educated, you are too, so you won't make the same mistake. Um, Dow is on um, Dow Mountain. It's a beautiful visit if you ever get to go out to Paso Robles. I highly recommend. Far less traveled than your Napa's and Sonoma's. And so many amazing vineyards to explore out there. A little less expensive, a little less crowded. So absolutely recommend. The Dow brothers actually are from Lebanon, uh, Beirut. They grew, that was where they grew up. But when things started getting um, pretty uh, crazy over there, their family moved to Paris, which is how their family really came to love wine. And in the 80s, the brothers, George and Daniel, moved to the US. And just like the American story, right, they started a technology company and made a bajillion dollars so they could buy a winery. <laughs> As many of the winery owners do, they made a large fortune somewhere else so they could make a small fortune doing what they love. So that's exactly what they do. This is a Cabernet Sauvignon. This is their uh, 2018. It's been rated 92 points. Uh, from a couple of different wine critics out there and it's going to retail around $25. So a, a nice price point, I think, for a really well-made Cabernet. So the first thing again that we're going to do is hold it up and tilt it at an angle. This is how we really get a good vantage point. And if you have something white to hold behind it, that really helps you get a good view at the intensity of the color and the color. And this is pretty opaque ruby color for me. Um, it does, it's not having that brownness to it. It's more of that red ruby. So I would say, you know, pretty deep ruby colored. The other thing we're going to look at when we're tasting wine is the legs of your wine. So if you go ahead and swirl up your wine, and I used to think swirling was pretentious, but it's not. We have a reason. Swirl it up and then hold it up to the light. And eventually, and it's going to take a minute, you're gonna see little trails of wine dripping down the side of your glass. You kind of have to move around a little bit and it might take a minute to form. Mine are just, just starting. And what those legs tell you about, if they are thin and fast moving, which this is not, then it's a light body, low alcohol wine. If they're fatter and slower moving, this is a fuller bodied, higher alcohol wine which this is. And if you're at the store and you're saying, well, I can't open the bottle and look at the legs, how am I gonna know if it's a light wine or a medium or a full? All you have to do is look at the bottle. The bottle always lists the alcohol percentage. And anytime it's under 12%, that's a light bodied wine. Between 12 and 14 are your medium. And then 14% alcohol on up are your full bodied. Both of our reds tonight are over 14%, just a tad over 14 and a half. Um, so these are in that full bodied and now I clearly see my legs. So see, it took a little while for them to be fully formed, but they're very formed. And with red wine, it's easier to see them with your whites, but all reds and whites, still wines, you'll be able to look at this. It's kind of a party trick, but we use it in blind tastings in the wine business to kind of anticipate what the wine might be or guess what the wine might be. Some wines are higher alcohol, fuller bodied wines, some climates or places are, and it's just a little guess for us as we're trying to guess what's in the glass. Has anybody done a blind tasting out there? Raise your hand if you've done a blind tasting chat. Yeah, 
I mean, there are some really fun back in the day when we did live tastings. I've done a whole bunch of them at wine festivals and and all over it. It's fun to do with friends. Bag up your wines, put them in glasses and then try to see if you can guess. If you have a Merlot from France, a Merlot from California, a Merlot from Maryland, that's where I'm based. Uh, so it, it's really a fun way to do a tasting with friends. All right, you're like, I've had enough looking at this wine. Let's move on, swirl it up again, which is gonna vaporize the alcohol. Now I want you to stick your nose in the glass. All the way, I don't want any dainty smelling. You will not fall in people, I promise. So swirl it up, stick the nose in. And just try to think of a couple things that you get on the nose. Cabernet Sauvignon, I'm getting very classic dark fruit here. So black cherry, black currant. I'm getting some notes of the uh, months that this spent, 10 months in 60% new French oak. So you're getting that toasty oak note, maybe some baking spices there air, tobacco, those sort of things can indicate oak aging. Um, and just, this takes practice, right? It's not uh, something you just wake up one day and you're able to definitively talk about what you smell in your wine. This is what we work every day, all day on in the wine world. And so to become a better wine taster, you wanna become a better smeller. And that just takes practice because this smelling part is 80% of tasting wine and food for that matter. Um, because you know, when you smell the wine or the food going in the kitchen, that chef's cooking, you get hungry. And that smell is really um, the most of what you're getting out of it. It's your, your nose is your gateway to the olfactory. And it's the part of your brain that knows what things smell like. But now when we take the sip, what your mouth does know, because it doesn't know black cherry, it doesn't know black currant, it knows sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and savory. And so when you take the sip, you're going to get a sensation possibly of one of those, and you're also going to feel the weight and the texture of the wine. Um, so let's go ahead, everybody take a sip of your Cabernet if you have it. I don't know if you saw me take a little air in there, we call that feathering. Just kind of aerates the wine a little bit, helps get it through your retronasal because you can smell things while they're in your mouth. The wine has a nice weight to it on the, on the palate. And also something that red wine has that white wine and sparkling wine does not, it's called tannin. And the tannin comes from the grape skins. It's an antioxidant. It's one of the great polyphenols that makes red wine so healthy for you but we perceive it in your mouth like a bitterness, like a dry astringency. So if you felt the roof of your mouth become dry, your tongue, your teeth, any of that, that's from the tannin. And some people love tannin, which I do. <laughs> Other people, you might be like, wow, that was a little abrasive. I don't know if I, I'm digging this. The good news about tannin, especially with beef, is that tannin binds with animal proteins. So remember with the appetizer, I was looking for something softer and lighter, right? Because we have this pate rather than a big juicy fatty steak or stew. We want more tannin, we want more weight to the wine and this absolutely gives this to us right here in the Cabernet Sauvignon. So I love the Dow Cabernet Sauvignon. I think it's a great value. It's gonna be a really fun pairing with the filet mignon and the pan sauce that chef is going to teach us about. So I hope you guys are enjoying this one and this pick. Um, and then the next door to that, I thought it'd be really fun to taste a Zinfandel. Now, just to finish out, we looked at the wine, we smelled it, we tasted it. To fully describe that wine, I would say full-bodied with aromas of black currant, black cherry, cedar and tobacco, and moderate tannins because it's not over the top tannin. You get that bit of bitter astringency, but it's not wow, like I might get with my favorite Barolos or some of Petite Syrahs that are really, really tannic. So this, I would say moderate tannin. So in describing any wine, think body, aromas, and then with red wine, talk about the tannins. With white wines, we talk about acidity, but we're not tasting any whites tonight. We want our sexy reds tonight for Valentine's Day. So my other red that I picked out for our pairing, um, and the reason why I'm telling you about these all up front is one, I know you guys are gonna start drinking before Chef's demo, <laughs> or maybe you already have. And so I want you to know a little bit about what you're tasting. And then we always try the wines first alone 
Then we try the food and then we go back to the wine. It's what I call a wine sandwich. So after chef's demo, her and I are gonna come back together and we're gonna do some wine sandwiches with you, rosé with the appetizer and these two reds with the filet and talk about why it works so well. I've kind of alluded to it, but we'll get into more detail at that time. All right, so our next red is the Paul uh, Dolan Vineyards Zinfandel, and this is from Mendocino County. And this is actually considered made with organic grapes. And so there are a couple different designations within the USDA of organic when it, with regard to wines. You could be fully organic or you could be made with organic grapes. And the difference of the two is with, with made with organic grapes, which Paul Dolan Zinfandel is, you can add a tiny bit of sulfites to preserve the wine so that it doesn't turn color or grow bacteria but it has to be under 100 parts per million. If you want to be fully USDA organic, you cannot add any sulfites. And that gives your wine a pretty short shelf life. Um, but in both cases, no chemicals, pesticides, all of that. Um, but they don't consider all of the different things that Paul Dolan, that winery does to become sustainable, which is a word we talk a lot about in the wine industry. So in addition, to becoming or made with organic grapes. They use all renewable energy sources. They use cover crops to sort of ward off pests and fill in the vineyard. And they're really thinking about the vineyard and the winery as a whole. And they go way beyond what the USDA might require to become organic. So um, you know when you see made with organic grapes that this is really done in almost every organic way except for a touch of sulfite so that it can last you know, more than a few months or a year. Zinfandel, any fans out there of Zinfandel? I don't know. Um, I know people People are noshing and drinking, but oh, okay, I got a fan, I like that. Both hands. Um, Zinfandel is the quintessential California grape. I mean, if there's one grape, because you know, Cal California Cab, of course, delicious, but Zin is our kind of claim to fame. And so I thought this would be fun in there. Also 14.5% alcohol, so this is going to be a fuller body, but Zin is known for more jammy fruit, more concentrated fruit, uh, and so let's go ahead and try it. Uh, go ahead and again, you're going to get pretty concentrated uh, color on that in that ruby family, maybe, maybe a, ta a tad less color um, intensity there, and you're going to see similarly on your legs because these have identical alcohol percentages, you're going to see those fatter, slower moving legs. There's one other thing that will slow down your legs and make them inch down the glass rather than fall more fast and it's sugar. So that doesn't really come into play with this wine, but if you like port or dessert wines, you're probably gonna notice those have slow moving fat legs. Um, and so something to look at one time when you're enjoying your dessert, maybe on Valentine's Day, some chocolate which by the way, that Zinfandel is great with chocolate. It's one of the few reds that I really think can work, dry reds that works with chocolate. All right, now that you've looked at that, go ahead, swirl it back up and smell it. Hopefully you're getting that intensity of the fruit there. Also, this is aged in American oak, so you can get things like dill um, and notes that like that that we don't get off the French oak from the Dow. Again, lots of berry fruit, maybe even red berry in there, a combination of red berries and blackberries. Go ahead and take a sip. A little bit different, right? You get that, it almost feels like sweet, but it's just the fruitiness of the wine up front, a little bit tad of that tannin and um, some, acidity because your mouth is a watering as well. So again, a different style, but also full bodied could handle, filet mignon is a fairly lean meat. So we don't need to go over the top with our reds either. So what I thought would be fun now is that you have two different reds to compare with your filet and your pan sauce um, as we go through the wine sandwiches after the demo. All right, other things that Cabernet is great with, blue cheeses, grilled meats and burgers, same goes with Zimpin. Um, so beef friendly, these two wines, I mean, they're just absolutely made for beef. And so uh, they can go a lot of different ways. They don't have to only go with a filet mignon. You can dress them down with a burger or dress them up 
up with the fillet, which we're, which we're going to do tonight. Uh, any questions? Let's get some chocolate in your post. Ooh, all right. I know. Caitlin gives the best post workout swag, I just have to say. Um, and uh, should I show them a little bit of our, of the beef uh, checkoff? So we have also part of our swag, we have a champagne saver. And just in case you don't drink all your champagne this evening or your sparkling wine and um, what we have is the champagne saver every wine lover should have one of these you basically take the uh, piece you put it down in the neck of the bottle you press down you clip it around the lip of the sparkling wine or champagne bottle voila now your bubbles are trapped in this bottle it will stay bubbly for days you don't have to worry about it the next day or the following day or maybe you want it sunday for mimosas no need to worry because you have the champagne saver. So another great swag that will be in there and a tool that everybody should have. If you don't have one of those and you want just a low tech way tonight of saving your bubbly for tomorrow, stick the handle of a spoon down in the bottle and the handle will get very cold, colder than the wine below and it will keep the, the bubbles down further. It's not as fail safe as the champagne saver, but it's, it's a low tech way if you're ever trapped in a hotel room <laughs> without your champagne saver. But what I do is I keep one in my suitcase and my purse. So I never have to worry about that. All right, Kaylin, those are three wines. If we don't have any wine questions, I think I'm ready to uh, hand it over to Chef Laura for our cooking demo. Wonderful, thanks, Lori. I don't see any questions at the moment. Um, but we can circle back to them um, once you and Chef are back together. Awesome. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Hi, everybody. How are you? Welcome to our Valentine's Day, um, well, Valentine's Week um, event. Um, I really learned a lot from Lori just now. Um, as a chef, we get some wine training, but certainly the training that she's gone through is much more extensive. So I always appreciate hearing kind of the description and what I should be, should expect, um, knowing that my palate's going to be different than someone else's. So um, just enjoy the fact that I can actually try these then with her um, a little bit later so that we can enjoy um, telling you guys some stuff about the pairings themselves. So we are going to make an appetizer and we're going to do a steak. Now, um, I don't know if there's anybody in the audience right now for sure that's gonna cook along with me with the steak portion, but I'm just gonna do a really simple sear and then it's gonna go in the oven. And then once it comes out, we'll make a pan sauce while the steak is resting. So that'll just give us an option to um, just see that. I can talk a little bit about tenderloin. It's my background is, is beef and I'd be happy to answer any questions about um, how to use that as well. But the first thing I wanna do is I really wanna focus on our appetizer first and getting our bread toasted. So um, Lori mentioned getting that um, oven preheated. All we're gonna do is, this is kind of a thick baguette. Normally I would get a thinner baguette, but this is what they had at the store. And we're gonna just cut it into like what we call a, a bias cut, where we kind of cut at an angle. So we end up with more surface area. Now you certainly could use a serrated knife. Um, mine's pretty uh, tough in terms of the crust. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use um, a chef's knife. But as you can see, what's nice about cutting it on a bias like that, especially if you have a really small baguette, is that you kind of get a little handle to utilize where you can kind of fill it up to here and then and, and eat it that way versus trying to balance it. Um, sometimes the little circles um, end up being kind of difficult to, uh, to maneuver. So we're just going to cut some of that up. So if you haven't already, give me a few slices. I'm going to do probably eh, like six or so. I want to make sure that I have um, one to sample with Lori and our uh, sparkling option. And that's basically all you do. You could certainly use any type of bread you want to. If you um, need gluten-free bread, great. You could actually use a cucumber instead. We're going to make this dip. You could put it on a cucumber. I know Lori did that. Um, so she'll be able to, uh, to show you how that um, interacts as well um, with the um, pate. Now I say pate, most of you guys probably know that pate is actually, um, pate is really, you know, something that you normally see with liver. And what I like to um, call it this is just because it is a beef paste. What we're doing is we're creating a little beef paste 
that we can spread on crackers, we can spread on our crostini, we can utilize in many ways. And it's stuff usually that you have in your refrigerator, which I think is even better because I'd love to be able to make things um, quickly. If someone happens to say, well, we're gonna stop by, um, knowing that I have most of this stuff or at least um, a substitute for it is really nice. So what we're gonna do with our bread, I just made a few here. We are going to go ahead and just put a little bit of oil on it. Whatever you have, um, even spray, Pam spray, something like that is fine as well. I've got a little grapeseed oil. I'm just gonna use that. Um, certainly if you're doing olive oil, I would just suggest that you either um, put it into a smaller container or maybe put the bread in a container, drizzle a little bit and toss it around. But I'm just literally putting a little bit on there. I just wanna bring out a little bit of crustiness and a little bit of color. And I'm gonna go ahead and put this in my oven. And then we're gonna switch gears real briefly to our filet. Now those are only gonna take a few minutes. So I will normally set a timer, but I'm just gonna keep an eye on my timer that I have going here to make sure that we are ready to pull those out. But we want a nice crisp on them. We don't want them to get too crusty. If we end up with something too crusty, then what happens is that you end up um, really dealing with something that's so hard that it's not even pleasurable to eat. And you certainly don't want to be at a party or serving it at a party and someone breaks their tooth because it's been toasted too much. So the lighter, the better. Um, we toast things just so that we don't absorb too much. So being this is a paste versus like a tomato bruschetta or something like that, we're not really going to need to have a lot of toast on it. Um, so that's that. We've got that. And then we're going to revisit that as soon as we get our steaks going. So if you are doing steaks, these are two very large, didn't realize how big they were, <laughs> tenderloin steaks, or as you probably see them on menus and in the store marketed as filet mignon. Now filet mignon basically is a name that they give for thick cut tenderloin steaks. So this is a tenderloin. This comes from the whole tenderloin. This is um, a steak that actually has a tiny bit of marbling. You see a little bit here, but it really relies on seasoning and it also relies on what sauce you're gonna use. Some type of sauce, some type of, type of butter or compound butter, um, which we sometimes will make with different aromatics like green onion and garlic and onion and that type of thing. Um, all I did right here with my two steaks is put a little bit of garlic powder on both sides, a, um, quite a bit of salt. It can take a lot of salt and that's it. That's all I did. Didn't touch it, didn't do anything else, didn't you know, pressed it down or uh, manipulate in any shape or form. It came right out of the deli wrap and here it sits on the plate. Now, some people will ask me, do I need to take these out in advance? You'll hear on TV a lot of people saying, well, I'm sorry, but I take mine out like an hour in advance to get it to room temperature. It's really not necessary to get it to room temperature, but it's not a bad idea to take it out a little bit in advance so that you're not shocking it as much as it would if it came directly from a 41 degree refrigerator. So I suggest just maybe while you're getting your stuff together, while you're gathering all your ingredients, um, a term that we like to call mise en place. You can impress your uh, friends and neighbors with mise en place, which means everything in its place. As we're gathering ingredients and putting them all in our place, um, what's nice is to just kind of bring them out so they, they rise in temperature a little bit. Um, we don't like to really tell people to take them out an hour in advance because an hour to someone might be three hours because they've forgotten about them. And, you know, safety first. We want to make sure that we're um, telling people to, um, as part of someone who used to work for the Beef Association and working with Caitlin, I feel really important that I want people to be successful with steak and they don't have to um, worry too much about the result they're going to get. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on my induction oven. I'm using a cast iron pan and it might help if I plugged it in first. That's usually the case. And what we're gonna do is sear. So you'll hear a lot of people saying, oh, I just sear my steaks. Well, searing is really not a full-blown cooking method. Um, really you're pan frying. So when you're doing a sear, that is to get that caramelization on the outside of your steak. So whether you're using a grill or as, if you're using a um, skillet like I'm doing here, or whether you're doing something like putting it in vacuum seal and floating it in water like a sous vide um, preparation, that sous vide preparation then needs to be seared. That steak needs to be seared when it comes out of its packet. And if you have any questions about that, um, I think Lori was, maybe Lori was gonna do a sous vide steak. Um, we can do pan sauces with 
either searing beforehand or searing afterwards, after it's been cooked. So just keep that in mind. It's really up to the method that works the best for you. When I'm doing something as lean as tenderloin, I almost always do it inside the house. If I'm doing a ribeye, I almost always do that outside, just because of the fat content, the marbling, and how much you can get, um, you know, the, the, the uh, pop-ups that happened. And I just would prefer not to have to clean my, you know, most of my kitchen. Um, so we usually do those on the grill. So I'm just gonna wait for this to heat up. We're gonna add a little bit of oil. I say about two turns of the pan. If I was putting a ribeye in here, I wouldn't need to put oil in the pan. Plenty of fat, really good flavorful fat. And then what I am gonna be looking for before I put my steaks in, I'm gonna be looking for the viscosity of that oil to change. You know, oil obviously is like you know, when you're trying to mix it with water, you've got a totally different viscosity, which makes it difficult to do so. But as it starts heating, that viscosity changes and you'll start seeing it become looser. Obviously you'll see some smoke come up. I highly recommend that you um, avoid, now if you've used it and you've been successful with it, good for you, but I do not cook my steaks in olive oil. There's just way too many options for that for oils in general, like I'm using grapeseed, there's avocado oil, there's vegetable oil, there's canola. Those oils have a much higher smoke point. And that means your pan's not gonna just set, you know, not set fire, but smoke like crazy. So this allows me to kind of get that pan almost screaming hot without my oil starting to burn. So just keep that in mind. You wanna use um, uh, an oil with a higher smoke point. So then when I'm getting to the point where I'm like, you know, holding my hand a little bit above the pan, it's getting pretty hot. One of the things that you can do, which is a little, little trick, is take a wooden spoon, and when your oil is ready, or when you think you're about ready, put that wooden spoon bottom. And mine's not quite bubbling yet, but it should bubble around the wood. And that's because we're just introducing an element in there. Mine's not quite there yet. getting there, but not quite there. And what we're gonna do really with this tenderloin, oil, when the oil is ready, we're gonna put it onto sear for about two minutes, two to three minutes on just one side. Now, if you are cooking a thinner steak, and any of you guys who are cooking, if you're cooking a thinner steak, you can probably cook your steak from start to finish in the skillet. But because mine are like an inch and a half thick, I really need to give it some softer cooking so I'm gonna sear it for about two to three minutes on one side. I'm gonna flip it over, not even count how long it's gonna sear on that side. I'm just gonna put it in the oven, but I'll put it in the oven at 350. So it'll be a much more gentle type of finish to it. So it'll cook more from the inside out. What you don't want is you don't wanna put something in a really, really hot oven again after you've seared it and find out that you burn the outside and the inside is completely raw. Same goes for your grill. Always good to put it um, in a really hot part of your grill first. And then when you get the sear, move it over to either um, a burner that's not even on and close the lid or turn down the grill and then close the lid. So you create that kind of outdoor oven effect. So I'm gonna go ahead and see if we can find our, I'm not getting a really good, but I'm gonna go ahead. I might not have enough oil in there right now. But I'm gonna go ahead and take my tenderloin and put that in my pan. You hear that sizzle. And the reason I like to do skillet cooking is because you keep everything. If I put this on the grill, where is all my delicious juices going? You know, they're going down into the grill. Unless you put your cast iron grill on the grill or cast iron pan on the grill, then you would, you would maintain that. But that's why I like to do um, burgers and steaks really in skillets. Um, they're great on the grill, but I really like doing it this way because I can really preserve as much of that deliciousness. And you'll see it's kind of sticky. Actually, it's not too bad because we put oil in there. But if you've ever noticed when you're trying to flip a steak that you end up with um, the protein sticking to the pan, all that means is it's not quite ready to go. The protein is not released yet from the pan. So give it a few more seconds. If you feel like you're gonna burn it, turn your burner down or your grill down. 
And then I usually try to press a little bit, not to get the juices out, but just to try to make contact in all that area. And that's the other thing I like is you get more caramelization when you cook in a pan, right? Because every part of that side of the steak is making contact with the unit. And in this case, the pan on your grill, you're getting grill marks, which are beautiful as well. So look at this sear on here. That's just gorgeous. This one, I should have pushed it down a little bit earlier, but I'm gonna go ahead and flip it just in the interest of time. It'll finish a little bit more too as it's in the um, oven. And if you're at the point where you're about ready to put it in the oven, I'd like you to check your bread and see where you're at. See if you're ready to pull the bread. And then we can drop the temperature, but you can go ahead and put the steak in the oven if that's the way you're cooking it. My bread looks pretty good. I'm just gonna turn the temperature down on my oven. There we go. So bread looks good, got a little toast on it. It was 325, right, Chef? Chef? And then basically we want these to cool off. If we were gonna put something on like butter, or if we were maybe gonna even spread some garlic on, sometimes we'll take garlic um, cloves and just kind of spread that on, take a clove and just rub it to make something like a bruschetta, which is tomato basil, usually sometimes a Lamotte's little Parmesan. That garlic can adhere to the bread. That raw garlic is delicious. It kind of cooks a little bit. So then I'm gonna take this off and get this in the oven. And the other thing that you can do when you do put it into the oven is you can throw a couple of cloves of garlic. You can add a herb. Um, I have rosemary here. I'm actually just gonna add the herb when I um, do the sauce because rosemary is so strong I'd much rather just kind of have it roll around a little bit in the sauce or after I take it out of the oven than to cook with it the whole time. But you certainly can put garlic, but because I put garlic powder on it, I'm not too worried about um, not having that flavor. All right. Okay, so how are we doing? We got th thumbs up or just let me know. Is everybody doing okay? Thumbs up? Cool. Okay. like it. So the other thing that I'm going to do is get rid of this pan. It's got a nice little crisp on them. They're still a little soft on the inside, which I really like. But I don't really want to melt my cream cheese, my spreadable cheese. I really want that to be, um, you know, part of the pate. Pate is usually cold. Um, there are dips that people make that are a little bit different where they might heat them or cook it after they've combined everything. But I kind of like to just deal with the with the cold preparation. Okay, so mise en place. I've got my chives. So that's gonna go on after I've combined the roast beef and the alouette cheese. I got my little tray of roast beef and you can buy it at the deli. You can use, you know, the pre-packed meat like this. It really, I mean, if you have leftover roast beef, a great use of it. Um, this morning I had a beef bourguignon that didn't turn out in terms of flavor. I did it in the Instant Pot, which I thought was really fun and it was really fast, but my beef just did not have flavor. Didn't get enough caramelization on the sear and I just wasn't too excited about it. So I could have taken that beef and chopped it up and used it for this dip. Instead, what I did is I made a Mexican casserole this morning. So that was kind of fun. So what we're gonna do first is let's go ahead and chop our chives and then just kind of put those in a little bowl and we'll set those aside. Because we're not using any raw product, we don't have to worry as much about the food safety aspect. I had my filet mignon on a um, plate. I removed that plate, that is gone. I have not touched it with my hands. I've only used tongs. So that just, anytime you can really avoid any type of situation where you're sharing a cutting board, sharing a knife or a utensil with a raw product versus something like a fresh vegetable or even a um, processed, product like our roast beef um, is a good thing. Just keep that in mind. So I'm going to take my chives. 
probably don't need the entire packet. <laughs> so chives for days. Um, but what I kind of like to do is I like to give them a little bit of a little bit of length. I don't want to cut them into little tiny ringlets. So I'm going to again kind of do it a little bit on the bias to try to get a little bit of a effect. It's not going to make a huge difference. Ooh, my knife is not great. Um, the other thing, use a very sharp knife because these are kind of sticking together. But I kind of like to have a little bit of length to these because you're basically just going to kind of sprinkle them on top. So to have little itty bitty tiny ones is fine. Um, and then I might just kind of go through a little bit. I think I do need to sharpen them there. But then they look really pretty kind of thrown up on top. Um, the other thing you can do is you can cut them a little smaller and you can just add them right in to your um, alouette or whatever type of cheese you want to use. So that was one thing I want to talk about briefly is just substitutions. Um, I mentioned earlier that Lori um, decided instead of bread, she was going to use cucumber. Um, again, you can even cut, you know, cut a cucumber kind of on that bias and create that uh, bigger surface area. And that's a really lovely way to eat a dip like that, especially with the cheese and the beef. Um, but in terms of the cheese, you could use something like Boursin, which is another flavored type of uh, spreadable cheese. You could use regular cream cheese and just add a little seasoning. You could also um, use, uh, they have a chive and onion cream cheese that you could use that would kind of give you that same flavor. And you could even omit the chive and maybe put just a little garlic powder in it. You'd have almost the same flavor profile. Um, but I like this dip. It's something that came out, or pate, it came out of um, a program where we were just trying to do things with deli meats that were really simple and easy for people instead of having them have to make a steak every time. They were trying to do a crostini and we wanted there to be something that would be really easy that someone could make very quickly. Now, you can take the roast beef, you can make this uh, or put this in a food processor. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and cut mine. What I like to do in the, is kind of the same scenario I do with a leafy herb is I kind of try to roll this all up together kind of comes that way too, but I cut it into strips first and I just keep my, um, you know, a little claw hand where I have my um, uh, knuckles against my uh, knife and I kind of work my way through it, right? Just cutting into it. Okay, I'm swapping out my knife. So one thing that's nice, I have a lot of chef knives, so that's a bonus. Cut in, cut in. For those of you who are um, fairly new to cooking, if, if any of you are, um, the one thing that I just highly recommend is the most, um, keeping your knife on the board is so much easier than trying to continue to lift it up. So if you'll notice when I do it, I'll do it again. You notice when I roll this up, I'll do a little portion of it. I'm gonna roll it up. And I'm going to put that point on the board, point on the board. I'm not even going to move that. I'm just going to go down and pull through. This way, you're not moving your knife all over the place. You still got your knuckles against the blade. So it just really helps eliminate, for the most part, um, any kind of nips and stuff that you might get just because you continually move your knife around. Another thing, please make sure that you really get up onto your knife, choke up on it. Um, I've seen people try to cut, and cut, you know, using this because they're afraid of the blade. This does not give you any control. You know, this would be like holding your tennis racket or racquetball racket like this. There's no control. So always try to choke up. I say choke up because it reminds me of like choking up on a bat in baseball. Um, like this, and oftentimes I'll put even my uh, index finger on the blade, and that gives me a lot more control. So I go through, run it through, and then what I'll do, once I've got that kind of into smaller pieces, then we switch to the really easy, easy cutting. And that's hand up top, blade down, chop, 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 and just go through. Back and forth, I think you lift it just to move it to another part of the area of the beef. And then, you know, when you do it like this, you can make it a little bit more rustic, right? And not, don't have to cut it quite as far down as you would if you were pulverizing it in a food processor. So that's an option. 
The other thing you could do is if you said, you know what? I don't think I want to mix this together. I think I want to just put some cheese on a crostini and maybe top it with the roast beef. That enables you to do that as well. The one thing I say is when you're making a crostini is never make a crostini that has something on it that the person's going to bite into and it's going to come right off the crostini in total or it's going to fall on the floor. That's just one of those things you just don't want to have somebody that like, kind of tackle with something they're putting in their mouth at a party. Um, so I just recommend that things are small enough or they're big enough where someone can take a bite and they're not going to take everything with them. So like if you're doing a steak piece, just be conscious of that, that those can be, can be pulled right off of the entire crostini and end up, uh, you know, landing on their plate or landing on the floor or something like that, which can be kind of embarrassing. So the one thing you'll notice about me is I don't measure anything. I mean, chefs don't usually for the most part. Um, this, I took a little bit off because I was going to show you another uh, way to kind of serve this dip. This is probably, oh, I don't know, six ounces or something like that. I took off probably an ounce. I'm going to go ahead and put that in a bowl. I'm going to leave my chives for now. And if some of them get mixed in, no big deal. And then I'm going to take my alouette. Now the alouette, I'll, I'll give you fair warning. If you're not a huge garlic fan, I would highly suggest that you move aside the top part because that top part is all raw garlic, if you see that. Now, I personally like that because I think that is something that does react with the wine too, which I think is really cool. So you get this kind of bite of this savoriness and then you get a little bit of that sweetness from the wine. So we're doing about a half a cup. Like I said, I kind of just eyeball it. And you know what? Air on the side of caution, you can always add more. You can't take it out once it's mixed in. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this going. Now my steak has probably been in there, I'd say what, five or six minutes. So I'll probably do a quick check. But what I wanna do is I wanna get this going and have you guys start dressing your, spreading this on your pastinis. Yeah, and if you look at it, it might be kind of weird to you guys, but keep in mind, this is a really nice flavor profile. And if you like something like, I'm a huge corned beef person. I love corned beef. I love pastrami. So I would even just do this with corned beef or pastrami. Now I might, instead of doing the prepared cream cheese like, or the spreadable cheese like this that has a lot of flavor to it, I might do a regular whipped cream cheese. Are you still there? Over steak, same deal. You can do the same thing. All right. So that was a really hard appetizer, wasn't it? Whew. I'm worn out. So I'm going to set that aside for now. I'm not really going to go ahead and get these. Mine are dry, uh, cooled off enough. If you guys are ready. And I just take it. I like one of these little bagel spreaders. It's kind of nice, but just any knife. And you're basically going to take I don't know, about a tablespoon and a half, depending upon the size of your bread. And you're going to spread it on there. So there's your, your pate, just like you would see, you know, on a meat and cheese board. And then I'm going to put, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to dress all mine real quick. And then I'm going to put my chive. Some of these pieces of bread were fairly large. But really good nibbles, for sure. And a nice nibble that you can keep out for a little while because this roast beef will have, um, you know, it can be served room temperature. Um, you know, it's already cooked. Um, my husband has just asked for one, so I'm gonna, he's gonna we're lose one on the platter. Um, but then, you know, I mean, you can leave them out a little bit. They don't have any mayonnaise in them. You know, they just have some cream cheese. And I think just doing something unique like this is kind of fun because people are not going to expect it. They're going to be like, what is that? And <laughs> you can tell them that you made this really fast and easy cream cheese roast beef dip, well, pate. 
like that. There we go. I will often take them off to the side, get rid of the, I'm, I'm all into like taking pictures of food as so many of us are nowadays. But I like to make sure I clean off my plate. Normally you do an odd number of items just to let you know. So I've got three here. I'm just gonna plate kind of fun. And then I'm just gonna put a little bit of little chive on it. And that green, of course, too, if you're if you're presenting this, it just makes for such a pretty a pretty plate. You could have them all lined up on a tray. You could have them on a plate like this. You could serve it as a little um, a mousse bouche, which is kind of like a precursor to a meal to get them excited about what meal they're having, especially if you're serving a beef dish. It looks beautiful, Jeff. Does it look okay? Yeah. All right. I'm a little embarrassed to show you mine, but you'll get to see what a non <laughs> <laughs> No, don't worry about that. Believe me. I don't have many followers on Instagram. I'm so I'm assuming you'll see that I'm more excited about them than other people are, but that's all right. I don't mind that. Okay, so go ahead and make sure you've got your crostinis going. If you're not making anything, just continue to to listen. Um, what I wanted to tell you briefly about when waiting for my steak, I'm going to give it probably a few more minutes and then I'm going to check it. Um, normally, a steak of that size, inch and a half to two inches is probably going to take anywhere from 13 to 18 minutes in a 350 oven. So now I put it in at 425, drop the temperature. So it may end up being, um, it may finish a little bit earlier than that. It's also very dependent on your, um, your oven. And if you've used convection, you want to set that a little bit um, um, below, about 25 degrees less. So you would be doing something like 325 at convection. And I want to show you one other thing with the dip and that's I just put together this isn't really a meat and cheese board it's really more of a what I had in the refrigerator board for you guys because I thought the colors were really pretty but then I would just very simply throw this in there you know throw throw a few crackers on there as well so people do have something that they can eat that's a little healthier um but then a few crackers and then mix that with some other, we got some beef salami and also some roast beef. Um, kind of a pretty little presentation to put on your um, table when people come in. I always have cold appetizers because cold appetizers, you're not stuck in the kitchen dealing with them. Cold appetizers are fantastic. The more you can prep in advance, when we can get back to having much more social occasions um, is important. Chef, we did have a question come in, if now. Sure. Good. Sure. Lisa asks, is convection or regular baking best for beef or doesn't it matter? Um, you know, it kind of depends. It's, I would probably, with convection, you have, you know, this air and this um, ability to have the air go around. The flow goes all the way around it during its baking. I think of it more so for roasts than I would for a steak, which I'm going to be cooking pretty quickly. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily need to use it. Um, I frankly just got a convection oven in my own home and I keep forgetting that I have it. Um, and so I do need to examine that a little bit. I will tell you that um, people who are getting air fryers, my husband and I have been using an air fryer quite a bit lately for, um, for other proteins and, and other items. And I've even cooked a steak in it before. Um, that's basically a convection oven that's very contained. So imagine that if your own convection oven was smaller, you're dealing with more of an air fryer situation. Um, I like to use an air fryer for some fattier stuff because it just doesn't, you know, go all over the place. It's contained in the little basket that I utilize. Um, so I don't think it's, it's personal preference, whatever works best for you. If you want to cook it a little faster, um, you know, it will have kind of that circulated air going around. But I know a lot of, um, you know, commercial kitchens use a lot of convection just to kind of speed things along a little bit. Um, yeah, so up to you, up to you. I, I basically just use regular. Just a regular. Barista also asked, can they put the appetizer back in the oven? I mean, you certainly could if you want to heat it, but one thing that you need to know about reheating beef, um, even deli lunch meat, is you need to make sure that you re reheat it. Um, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong camera. Um, you need to make sure that you reheat it to about 165 because that's a safe 
temperature to eat something that has been previously cooked and chilled. So like if you were reheating a steak, you don't have to reheat it at all. You can just eat it cold. But if you are reheating a steak, you definitely need to make sure that you get it to 165. That's the safe temperature mm. for reheating something that has already gone down to, um, to like a refrigerator temperature. But yeah, certainly you could throw that in there if you wanted to melt it a little bit. You could even put a little bit of, um, you know, other cheese in it if you wanted to have a little bit more of a melty, chewy kind of experience, like something super neutral, you know, a little bit of, um, probably not parm because that's too salty for this, but um, even like a little Munster or a little Gouda, um, maybe not smoked, but a Gouda or something like that that would just give you a little bit of chew when you pull, um, you know, when you, when you bite into it and pull it. But yeah, you certainly could do that. Um, a lot of times what I've seen is people will take the whole dip and put it in a, in a container or a crock and then heat it and make it into like a dip that you can dip chips in or dip crackers in. So that would be another option. And then you could just have your crostinis on the side. So that would be a way to do it. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and check my steak real quick. And we'll get into- While you, while you check that, I'm gonna share, um, Jody had a great comment. She said, this is really delicious. Last time she got roast beef, she didn't love it. Um, mm -hmm. so she went to the store, a different store this time, and really thinks that the roast beef adds a peppery flavor to the appetizer, which makes it delicious. Mm -hmm. I agree. Awesome. And, and it is about, there's so many different kinds of deli roast beefs that you can get in brands. So I guess it takes a little experimenting. Exactly. Yeah, that's the nice thing about it is that there's a lot of, there's a lot. Okay, I'm pretty comfortable with my temperature here. Now you'll see that I'm just pressing on it. Um, that comes from kind of years of experience because I don't like to cut into a steak to check the temperature. But we also like to use the handy dandy thermometer, which in my opinion is the best way to check a steak, right? And what you wanna do, I lost my tongs. What you wanna do is basically take it in from the side. I'm gonna kind of lift it up, get it from the side. Cause what happens is when you have a hot pan like this, people tend to go all the way through and hit the pan. So if you do it from the top and you hit the pan, you're going to get a much higher temperature and the chances of you finishing it is going to be, um, I mean, it being fully cooked is going to, um, well, it's just going to be off. Um, mine's still at like a 120 or so. What I would normally do just in the interest of time is um, I would normally just take, casserole is a little difficult to do it in, but I would take my rosemary. I'm going to smash some garlic real quick. And just throw some garlic in there. Feel that, get that in there. And I don't even slice it, I just, I just throw it in there. And then what normally what we do is what chefs call basting, some will call it napping, um, it is to get enough butter in there, this would still be on potentially a stove top, um, Lori, did you do the um, sous vide steak? Uh, I did not this time, but I often do. Um, yep. And the great thing about the sous vide is you basically get a big pot of water and the sous vide cooking element goes inside of that. Yep. You put your, your filet in a Ziploc bag with oil and garlic and whatever spices you want. And you, the Ziploc goes in the water. You kind of attach it to the side of the pan so it doesn't submerge. And then you just put whatever temperature you want to reach. I, I don't know if my temperature would be the official uh, word of it, <laughs> but um, you put your temperature and it'll just, you know, you can set it an hour ahead. Once it reaches the temperature, it'll yep. sit there and then I just sear it to finish. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really great method. We've been doing a lot more of that here at home. Um, to do steak is to control that temperature. Um, steak is really hard to, control temperature, um, especially if you have a thinner cut. What I'm doing now is I'm basically putting my pan, I took my steaks out to rest. I would like those to rest for about 10 minutes or so. They're only at 120. I'm marrying, um, I'm going to um, let those sit for a little bit. Um, I don't necessarily want them to go all the way to temperature. I would normally pull these at about 135 and then I would start using this napping process. The reason I'm doing that is that I probably will end up reheating 
them tomorrow. So we're heating them and now this enables me to put these in the oven at a pretty low temperature and kind of bring them up to temperature and then I'll finish them. If I try to reheat these and they're fully, fully cooked, then we end up with just an issue um, of them overcooking and then you've kind of ruined the cup. Okay, quickly, rosemary, I threw that in there, garlic clove. This is all the fond. The fond is what is left behind when you sear the steaks and when you cook in the skillet. We're gonna add to that our beautiful Dow Cabernet Sauvignon, that one that has all the tannins. And then that's a half a cup and then a half a cup of beef stock. I'm basically gonna increase the temperature and I'm gonna reduce this to half. So it will just continue as you turn your temperature up a little bit. You're not looking for a thick sauce. If you wanted a thicker sauce, what I would recommend is getting a little bit of cornstarch, about a tablespoon of cornstarch, a tablespoon of cold water, put it in a little bowl, mix it up, add it to your um, sauce, make sure that it comes up to temperature so it'll start to thicken. So that's just what's called a cornstarch slurry and that can thicken it. I frankly like to just have a fairly loose sauce. This will get a little tighter when it reduces because it's gonna go down by about half. Should only take a few minutes because I'm on a pretty high temperature. And then what we'll do at the very end is basically add a little bit of butter. If you add cold butter to this warm liquid, what will happen is that it will end up making it look a little more glossy. So it adds a, lo a little sheen to the sauce. And I think it's very, very pretty that way. Now I can smell this rosemary is like full out in my kitchen. When I'm done with the sauce, I'm gonna go ahead, pull out that garlic clove, pull out that rosemary, and then we'll have a nice little sauce to put on top of the tenderloin. Now you could also put the steaks back in if you wanted and kind of baste it a little bit in the sauce if you want to, but most people aren't gonna want that much sauce on a steak, they're gonna want just a hint of it, enough to cook, you know, enough to work with their um, steak, but probably not needing it for, you know, the sides. So a little drizzle over the top that will add some really pretty flavor. So as this reduces, do we wanna go ahead and start doing some tasting or? Yes, chef. I've got all my food ready. I just took a second there to get everything uh, okay. cleaned up. And if you want to start with your rosé bubbly and our appetizer, I yes. think it'll be the first wine sandwich that we should start with. Awesome. Mm, mm. And, oh, I'll show you my finished product. No, not as beautiful as yours, but I do. Let me see. Some, some variations. Oh, they look gorgeous. I couldn't find chives, so I did scallions. I hope that was okay of a substitution there. That's a perfect substitution. And the thing is with um, chives is they go bad really fast. So okay. green onions you can have in your fridge for a little while. Um, and I like that because I like to be able to utilize, um, you know, utilize them a couple times because I'm not going to use a whole thing of chives in one dish, more than likely. Cucumber and some gluten-free crackers because apparently since COVID I'm gluten-free. I don't know who knows <laughs> what my body is uh, rebelling against this thing. So whenever you're ready, you let me know and we'll taste our uh, pate and rosé. All right, I just took a bite. Nope. Oh, okay, I can't come into view. So I can Let's see. All right. So the whole idea, guys, with the wine sandwiches, first I want you to taste the rosé bubbly again. Just remind your mouth Oops. real quick. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, I'm not in the camera. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not used to having two cameras where I have to walk. There you go. Together. So remind your mouth of that rosé bubbly, chef. Then, I mean, all that great red fruit we had that, those really lovely dissolving bubbles. The mouth-watering aspect. Then take a bite of your pate. Mm. Mm -hmm. So good. Cheers. Cheers. Sip of the wine. The wine, food, wine. That's how you make a wine sandwich. And on that second sip, see how that mm. acidity just smooths right out? Uh, it almost like the more of the fruit comes forward. Yeah. So, the salt, the saltiness, which is coming from the cheese and the deli meat, right? Because it's secured, it's got that saltiness to it. 
is smoothing out all that acidity in the sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. Go even with a little bit more of an acidic sparkling wine with this as well, because it does have that good salt. I don't know if you can see, mine's a little bit pinker and a little bit more resembling a true pate. And that's because I used our little food processor. I didn't hand chop like Chef did. She has great knife skills. I do not. So I love the food processor and it gets a little bit more integrated with the Alouette. But I really love this together. And especially with the cucumber, it's a fun, um, lighter pairing. Um, it's oh. di different with the bread aspect too. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that tastes really nice together. Um, I've not done a lot of um, kind of the bubbly and it, with food. I mean, I've had it, obviously, but I really like the way it tastes with that, especially the salt of the roast beef and the cheese. And when you're matching the weight of the food to the weight of the wine, I mentioned earlier, that's one of our overriding things. That's why we do our light whites with our delicate seafoods and then get into our reds with our meats. But what's so great about rosé, whether it's still or bubbly, is that it can really hit that middle ground. And so you can do these light beef dishes with these rosés because they're kind of like a weak red. You know, they really are made a lot like a red wine. It's just that skin contact uh, isn't there for a long period of time. So I love this. You could do it with a carpaccio. You could just do it yep. with your rare roast beef on a crostini with, you know, what's really good with this too is brie. Little yep. piece of roast beef, brie on a crostini. That'd be delicious as well. Love it. Thank you, chef. Oh, thank you. Great pairing. All right. I turned my pan off just because it's a little bit loud. I love it. Jody said, I totally thought this would be gross, but it's delicious. I love that. <laughs> it's, I, it is. Okay. So let me tell a really quick story. It'll take me two seconds. Not two seconds. A minute. Less than a minute. Um, I grew up with a, an aunt of mine making ring bologna and pickle sandwiches. I know that sounds really weird. But then my mom started making corned beef dip with that dried corned beef that comes in the jar, like the Hormel jar. And I loved it. And so then I started thinking, well, corned beef and this together. So it really first became a corned beef pate, but then it kind of morphed into, well, you can do roast beef, you can do corned beef. Roast beef is just not as salty. So I think it kind of goes with this seasoned cheese a little bit better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's weird, but it works. It's and like I said, you kind of heat this up. You could definitely put this in a crock, put it in the oven, and get it melty, maybe even put, like I said, a little bit of melty cheese over the top and then serve it with your crostini, just your plain bread. Yeah. It'd be delicious. And Jody also said she could see doing it with potato chips, just like a dip. Mm -hmm. um, and she's going to try our cucumber idea. Yeah, I think if you get um, those potato chips, like the wavy type, like ones that are a little sturdier or the kettle, the kettle chips, that would work. Regular chips would probably break in half, but... Um, Certainly, yeah. Yeah, I know it's a very different kind of recipe, but I think it's a really fast and easy one. It surprises people. And don't forget, guys, Caitlin put in the chat window the link for the post survey, which you got to do to get your swag. So don't, don't forget about that. Oh, yeah. How are the, uh, how is the filet of the sauce coming? I'm going to go ahead and get my volume turned up a little bit just so that I can hear a little bit better with this machine on. Okay, there we go. Okay, so my filet is out. It rested for about five minutes. Um, this is not quite ready, but I've got the flavor profile. Might be a little bit too whiny, but the wine will, um, the Never. flavor will stay. Hmm? Never too whiny. Well, I, I know I shouldn't say that. <laughs> not for me, for sure. But I'll go ahead and get this. I'm going to get this up to temperature. I'm going to slice some of my beef. And then I'll add a little bit of butter and then I'll sample it and we'll do the, the, the next two wines. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Perfect. Okay, let me find my knife. You could do this pate with a still rosé as well. Oh, okay. Not oh, guys. <laughs> Whoever didn't cook tenderloin, you're going to be plumped out. <laughs> we'll have to cook it on Sunday. <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> We like to have Valentine's Day at home. Well, one, because I'm spoiled and I'm married to a chef. So why do I want to go to a restaurant when I have my best uh, chef with me right at home? Exactly. Um, it's always so crowded 
out at restaurants on Valentine's and, you know, it, it's double the price, it seems. So we just rather go out either before Valentine's or after and have Valentine's at home. That's. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Not getting a lot of sauce over there. Okay. I'm going to tilt it. Little view of Let me just get my pan tilted a little bit so I can get some of that goodness. My steak is done. I'll bring this over here so you guys can see it a little bit better. You're not going to see me necessarily, but you're going to see how about this. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. That's what we want to see. Beautiful. So there's the steak. I'm going to take a little fork. First, I'm going to try my sip of wine, correct? Yes. Let's go to the Dow Cab. And what's great is I always believe that you should, in your cooking, you should use wines that you absolutely would drink. Don't go buy something that's so cheap and, and you don't like the taste right. of it. Now, maybe you don't want to use this Dow Cab. You, because you spent $25, maybe you want to use a great $15 cab that you love, but only use in your sauce an ingredient that you enjoy. You would drink. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it might be a little bit less, uh, less expensive, but you would drink. I don't like to cook with wine that I really want to drink. So if it was more expensive, I would definitely want to hold off for that. Okay. Oh. All right, so we're going to sip. <laughs> I lost my fork. Hold on. So yeah, go back and sip the... Um, cab then take a little bite of your filet with the sauce and what's great about what she did is she married or bridged the flavor there by using the sauce in the actual wine she's going to try in the sauce so i'm just going to cut oh. off i did not cut my filet i left it one big whole filet you're you were the smart one there oh. right, we'll a little little beef so try the cab yeah, I did. No, I just did this bite. Oh. Oh my God, that's great. I'm hearing good exclamations. I like that. That's my husband who can't stop coming into the kitchen. <laughs> Quality control. See, this is how you get the Valentine's going. This is uh, the relationship. <laughs> well, this is, this is uh, because I have a special event. I'm cooking for a couple on Valentine's Day. So this is our pre-Valentine's pre, our pre -Valentine's Day. So when, after you take the second sip of the cab, the reason why it's so luscious is that tannin that we experienced when it was all by itself is softened by the fat in the beef. And that's one of those food and wine pairing rules. Like we were matching the weights, right? So we're going to something weightier. We're going yeah. into a bigger red. But now we have this tannin component, anything with fat. So that could be cheese. That can be meat is going to serve that tannin right out. And I think you probably got that on the wine sandwich, Chef. And hopefully- yeah, no, I think, I think when I had it alone, the tannins are too much for me. Gotcha. Like I couldn't just drink this as an enjoyable wine, sit there and dry out my mouth that way. Right. But absolutely. And I can imagine that with a ribeye, like even more fat, kind of. Ooh, hmm. You can Close almost it. go bigger with that cab than this filet. And that's what's going to be fun now if you go to the Zinfandel now, because yep. the Zinfandel was a little less tannic than the cab. So let's go back and remind of that. And now I have my filet with, um, I just drizzled the, the sauce on top. I'm just going to dip mine in the sauce. <laughs> Get a little bit better coverage. And what's so great with that Zin, I don't know if you're, you're getting it too, Chef, but so much more fruit is coming forward. I'd already had such amazing fruit to begin with. Oh, yeah. But almost getting that, you know, jammy fruit that we love about Zinfandel coming forward. It's fun. Oh, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah, and it's good because you're using a Zinfandel, but I cooked with a Cabernet. So it kind of shows it's what so kind of wine you can, you don't necessarily need to have the right. same exact wine that you're cooking with. You could, but you don't necessarily need to have that. And if you wanted your sauce to be fruitier, you could go with the Zin in the sauce versus right. 
doing the cab and the sauce. But that is to show you, there's not one exact wine for this filet. You could, there's a myriad. These are just two, I think, that are really fun. Two great California uh, cab, Anna's in. Both, I think, really affordable, but over deliver as far as value and um, for the price. So I hope everybody, you get to have these on Valentine's. Uh, this or something better. <laughs> and Chef, thank you so much. Oh, of course. That was so fun to do and to try those together I don't often get to do pairings oh. you know and taste them myself <laughs> and now you have three wines to enjoy for <laughs> for Sorry. the next few days yes everybody sure. else does too hopefully so well if you guys have any questions or anything uh, otherwise I think Caitlin's going to uh give you the next steps and and how uh, everything's going to work Perfect. Thank you both. This was great. Uh, I mean, I definitely picked up some new things that I didn't know. Um, so that was great. Um, as mentioned, I dropped the link to our post workshop survey in the chat. I can also follow up with that via email. Um, please share your feedback with us. We are hosting these workshops on a monthly basis. So if you have any feedback of what you would like to see in the future, um, or you know, things like of that nature, um, definitely let us know through that survey. As mentioned, we'll also be sending out Valentine's Day swag boxes. So we'll send that out once we receive your post-event survey. And then we wanna tease March's workshop. So March is National Deli Meat Month. So we're teaming up um, with the North American Meat Institute to bring you all uh, a beef she workshop. So it's focused on prepared beef cuts and it's a sushi style concept that is essentially um, making sushi, but with prepared beef items. So we're really looking forward and hope that you guys um, come back for that one on March 10th. You can sign up the same way that you signed up for this one uh, via our website. So we, we hope to have you back. And our last few minutes here, if there's any questions um, that you guys have that are lingering, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask that. Um, and if not, I keep forgetting to do this um, each workshop. So I'm gonna put us on gallery view. And if you guys could turn on your camera, I'd love to take a group picture of all of us together. Let's see. Give people a minute here. Oh, awesome. I love it. Yes, get your glass full, Lisa. <laughs> Rebecca, I love your dog. <laughs> I want to take one too. Wonderful. This is great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Awesome. Thank you for coming. All right. Thanks so much. Thank Valentine's. Galentine's. Uh, glad you guys all love wine and beef. And thanks, Caitlin, for putting this together. Yes, not a problem. for ready to be a part of it. It really had a lot of fun. Yes. Thank, thank, you, Chef. thank you. All right. Have a great evening, everybody. Cheers, thank you. Everyone. Bye. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> thanks.